Biden's backup plan. I didn't give any false hope. Hours after the Supreme Court struck down his student debt relief plan to erase $400 billion in debt for 43 million Americans, the president's pledge to find another way as the court makes another decision, a major blow to LGBTQ rights in America. Plus, I'm so grateful mm. for Medicaid because of, um, we couldn't, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it. It would be impossible. Families are facing losing Medicaid coverage as states purge their roles with the end of the pandemic. Our Rachel Scott is speaking with families and tracking the impact on their lives in our series, Through the Cracks. And remembering an Oscar and Tony Award winning performer known for his character acting from comedy to drama. Tonight, a tribute to Alan Arkin. You are the most beautiful girl in the whole world. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos, in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including severe weather, dangerous heat, air quality alerts impacting 200 million Americans. The city reporting the worst air quality in the world tonight. All of this happening during record holiday travel. More than 60 million people are on the move. The crush of passengers after a week marked by thousands of flight cancellations. And navigating the complicated relationship between a child and their donor parent. But we begin with the dramatic end to the Supreme Court's term, the pair of decisions that will have a major impact on tens of millions of Americans. In one case, the justices sided with a Christian web designer who did not want to cater to same-sex couples. The other case upended President Biden's plan to clear some $400 billion in student debt. The pair of rulings split completely on ideological lines. President Biden slammed the student loan decision saying, I think the court misinterpreted the Constitution. When do the tens of millions of Americans who owe money on student loans need to start paying again? And is there any reprieve coming? And there is also concern tonight. The ruling on LGBTQ rights could have far-reaching implications. Some saying it gives businesses a license to discriminate. Our team is standing by tonight to break down these landmark decisions and look at where the court and a divided country goes from here. We begin with Rachel Scott. Tonight, in a major blow to the Biden agenda, the Supreme Court blocking the president's sweeping plan to cancel $430 billion in federal student loan debt. In a 6-3 decision, the conservative majority ruling the administration overstepped its authority by forgiving the debt without approval from Congress. Chief Justice John Roberts writing the education secretary did not have the power to rewrite that statute from the ground up. In a dissenting opinion, Justice Elena Kagan writing, this court today decides that some 40 million Americans will not receive the benefits the plan provides because, so says the court, that assistance is too significant. Tonight, President Biden vowing to try again with a new debt relief plan under a different law, the Higher Education Act, but he warned it's going to take time. We'll use every tool at our disposal to get you the student debt relief you need and reach your dreams. It's good for the economy. It's good for the country. Biden's original plan to forgive up to $20,000 for some borrowers was the fulfillment of a campaign promise. 26 million Americans have already applied for the relief, like Renee Moya, who has $62,000 in student loans and recently took out a new mortgage. I do feel disappointed. We find ourselves in a situation where, because of that promise, a lot of us, literally tens of millions of us, made decisions with our lives to move forward. Whatever life choices we made, we made explicitly with the understanding that the president was going to get student loan cancellation done. Starting in October, borrowers will also have to restart their federal loan payments when a three-year pandemic pause comes to an end. But the president today said those borrowers will not face default for the first 12 months if they can't make those payments, though interest will still accrue. The administration will also roll out a new repayment plan for borrowers that will cap monthly payments at 5% of income, a plan the White House says could save Americans $1,000 a year. Republicans had argued Biden's original plan was unfair to people who already paid back their loans or didn't go to college because of costs. And tonight, Republican presidential candidates celebrating the ruling. And can I just say God bless the Supreme Court? 
they are making a lot of wrongs right. Late today, the president pressed on whether he gave Americans false hope. I didn't give Boris false hope, but the Republicans snatched away the hope that it was, they were given, and it's real, real hope. And Rachel Scott joins me now. Rachel, after this Supreme Court decision, where does this leave the 26 million people who already applied for the program? Well, Stephanie, an administration official tells me tonight that it will be months before they can even finalize the details of this new backup plan. And it's still not clear if the 16 million Americans who were already approved under the previous plan would have to reapply. So the bottom line here, the timeline is not clear on this new plan, and this can still face legal challenges, which could once again severely delay or bring this program to a halt. Stephanie? So much uncertainty. Thank you so much, Rachel. So what does this decision mean for your finances and for the country's economy? We are answering those questions and getting tips for borrowers later in the program. Now to today's other major case, pitting gay rights against free speech. The high court, by a six to three margin, ruled that a Christian web designer can refuse to create a wedding website for same-sex couples because it would violate her right to free speech. In her dissent, Justice Sonia Sotomayor called it the first time in history the court has allowed businesses to discriminate. ABC's senior national correspondent Terry Moran is at the Supreme Court. At the Supreme Court, a First Amendment ruling with far-reaching consequences. The court's conservative supermajority declaring that Denver-area website designer Lori Smith has a constitutional right to refuse to design wedding websites for gay couples. The court holding that Colorado's public accommodations law, which requires businesses that serve the general public to serve all equally, does not apply in cases where the product or service being offered expresses a message. And forcing Smith to serve gay couples, the court reasoned, would be compelling her to speak a message she does not believe in, violating her First Amendment rights. Justice Neil Gorsuch, writing for the court's conservatives, declaring, The First Amendment envisions the United States as a rich and complex place where all persons are free to think and speak as they wish, not as the government demands. Upholding the Colorado law in this case, Gorsuch added, would mean that the government could force an unwilling Muslim movie director to make a film with a Zionist message or compel an atheist muralist to accept a commission celebrating evangelical zeal. In dissent with her outnumbered liberal colleagues, Justice Sonia Sotomayor called the ruling profoundly wrong, arguing that it endows certain businesses open to the public with a constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class. And she offered her own examples of what might follow. A website designer could equally refuse to create a wedding website for an interracial couple, for example. A stationer could refuse to sell a birth announcement for a disabled couple because she opposes their having a child. For Lori Smith, who says her religious beliefs compel her refusal to serve gay couples with their wedding websites, vindication. Free speech is for everyone, and the court affirmed today that the government cannot force anyone to say something it doesn't believe. Colorado's attorney general dismayed. When a business opens its doors to the public, they've got to serve everybody. Today, for the first time, there's now an exception to that rule, and that exception is going to do untold damage. It Terry Moran joins us from the Supreme Court. And Terry, you've covered the court for so many years. Were either of these rulings a surprise? Not really, Stephanie. If you've been looking at this court over the past couple of years, it is eager to make a big difference in American life, as we've seen again and again and again. And these cases offered them the opportunity to do that. And the student loan case, look, it was no secret that this was a risky gambit by the president. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi is actually quoted in the opinion by the court uh, saying that the president doesn't have power to forgive this much debt. And President Obama looked at the, at the subject when he was president. He didn't think president had power to do it either. Supreme Court confirming that today. And as for the, for the website designer case, it is clear that this was a court that wanted to reach out and find a case to carve out free speech exceptions for people with religious objections to things like gay marriage. Buckle up, there's more to come. Stephanie? You're exactly right. Many more cases to watch in the next term. Thank you so much, Terry. For more on what this wide-sweeping ruling means, I'm joined by Professor Catherine Frankie. She is the director of Columbia Law School's Law, Rights, and Religion Project. Professor, thank you so much for speaking with us. While this case involved same-sex weddings and a Christian designer's opposition to them, its consequences are much broader than that. 
explain to us who else could be impacted by this ruling. Well, many of us who've been watching this case since it was filed um, a number of years ago were shocked, really, to see how broad Justice Gorsuch's opinion for the Supreme Court was. Not only did he find that there's a free speech right for a business um, owner like Lori Smith in this case to say, I don't have to comply with anti-discrimination laws because I have an opinion that um, opposes them, but the court gave us no limiting principles for how this broad uh, win for Lori Smith would apply in other cases. It is so broad that uh, any business owner could really say, I don't want to um, provide services to black people or black couples or Jews or people in interracial marriages or people about whom I have some opinion of them that I don't want to serve them. And that this, if the state tries to force me to serve them, then they're compelling me to associate or speak about something with which I disagree. So um, the limits of this decision are actually boundless in so many respects, and that's something that I think a lot of people are quite troubled by. And many people are saying it would leave the door wide open for discrimination. Now, does this ruling place other laws protecting LGBTQ rights in jeopardy? This ruling implicates pretty much any law, whether it's one that protects against LGBT-based discrimination or race discrimination, religion, national origin, to be sure. But um, its breadth could reach really any law. Say you had an opinion that um, climate change laws or laws in, in dealing with um, environmental justice or envir environmental protection, you don't agree with them. Um, and the state compelling you to comply with them uh, force you to give us to give it a, 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 a speech or a statement about those laws that you disagree with. One interesting note in this case is that the plaintiff at the time didn't have an online business and she hadn't been asked to build a website for a same sex wedding yet. She ended up with a case before the Supreme Court. So basically with a hypothetical scenario, how does that happen? Well, in the law, we have this concept of standing, that in order to bring a lawsuit, you have to have suffered some kind of injury that you would then complain about to the court and ask for a remedy. Um, and many people felt that the problem with this case wasn't so much the First Amendment issue as the fact that she actually hadn't been injured yet. And I think this case reflects what we've seen in a trend of Supreme Court cases, that there is an enormous sensitivity on the part of the majority of this Supreme Court to even conjured injuries to religious objectors to things like abortion or gay rights. And at the same time, the Supreme Court can't seem to be able to recognize in any form race or other kinds of discrimination. Well, it's certainly a ruling that is uh, striking a nerve with many, many people. Professor, thank you very much for your time. Columbia Law Professor Catherine Frankie, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And today was the final day of the Supreme Court's term. So for the big picture on the court's decisions this term and the road ahead, let's bring in our senior Washington reporter, Devin Dwyer. So Devin, we had two 6-3 decisions with the conservative majority joining together on today's cases, but we actually saw a mixed bag when it came to how the court ruled this term. Give us a sense of how that was all broken down. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, those six to three decisions, the conservatives versus the liberals, certainly get a lot of attention and for good reason. But this term, they were surprisingly rare. Of the 59 cases argued this term, most of them, 30 of them, were unanimous or near unanimous decisions. What's surprising most, however, is that only five of the opinions this term were decided purely along ideological lines, those six three decisions. That's down from 14 last term, and it's the lowest number, in fact, Stephanie in the last six years. That, of course, could reflect the continued influence of Chief Justice John Roberts. He's a moderate who's tried to urge the court to come to the middle and build consensus. He and Justice Brett Kavanaugh, it turns out, were the two justices most in the majority this term. So if you're looking for tea leaves going ahead on, on how a case is going to be decided, look to Roberts, look to Kavanaugh. 59 cases affecting millions of Americans. Now, Devin, in the past few years, we've seen the court make some really sweeping judgments, some of which have knocked down what's been considered settled law. Are there any other areas that the conservative majority could be poised to weigh in on that could have similar sweeping impact? 
Well, last term, we saw the conservative majority take down Roe versus Wade, which we all remember. This term, it was affirmative action. Uh, and looking ahead, there is another major precedent on the line next term. It involves how much leeway and flexibility federal agencies can have uh, when Congress doesn't spell out all the details about how they should do their jobs. It's a principle. You're going to hear a lot about it. It's known as Chevron deference. Conservatives have been trying to get rid of it for years and rein in the power of federal agencies. The decision could affect the government's ability to regulate pollution, the internet, gun accessories, and even our preparedness to the next global pandemic, Stephanie. So a lot on the line in that case next term, uh, just a few months away. Yeah, so much on the line. Now, looking ahead to the next term, the court said today it would take up a major gun rights case this fall. Explain that one to us and what kind of impact it could have. This is a really big case. The Supreme Court today said they would take up this fall. Uh, they're going to decide whether firearm restrictions put on uh, people accused of domestic violence uh, can pass constitutional muster under the Second Amendment. This is a case from Texas. It involves a convicted drug dealer who was charged with illegal possession of a gun uh, after a court had suspended his license. He was accused by his girlfriend uh, of, of beating her up. The Supreme Court will decide whether those types of rules against accused domestic violence violence uh, perpetrators uh, can stand around the country. Big impact, obviously, for gun owners, but also uh, in a lot of these communities where uh, these types of laws are seen as a, as a key linchpin in protecting women, Stephanie. A really, really big case there. Thank you so much, Devin. Devin Dwyer there for us in Washington covering the Supreme Court and the many cases affecting millions of Americans. Thanks, Devin. You bet. As the holiday weekend gets underway, we are tracking extreme weather coast to coast, excessive heat and smoky skies. New York City has some of the worst air quality in the world today, and those air quality alerts extend to 19 states. ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. Tonight, millions facing extreme weather from coast to coast. Midwestern storms reloading after a violent 24 hours and New York City covered in haze for a second day. The AQI, that is 155, still very hazy, and that is unhealthy for everyone. The Big Apple taking the top spot for the world's worst air for a major city. And across the South, record-breaking temperatures again, and even higher heat indexes. And west of Dallas and Colorado City, Texas, residents there have been without water for nearly a week. Our Maria Villarreal in Fort Worth, where first responders are worried. With this happening this early in the season and this response volume has been crazy, we're planning for the worst the rest of the summer. That stubborn dome of heat set to power more severe storms. Overnight, winds gusting to 100 miles an hour in the Midwest. A wall of thunderstorms we call a derecho, downing trees and knocking out power across hundreds of miles. And Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, you are monitoring quite a bit as we head into the holiday weekend, aren't you? Yeah, Stephanie, we'll start with the smoke, which has been very stubborn and very unhealthy across parts of the New York area. And we won't see this begin to clear really until we get chances for precip to uh, start to increase. Let me show you our computer model. In this case, the blue is bad, and you see it kind of hanging around uh, parts of the east and mid-Atlantic through Sunday, and then clearing up for everybody, I think, after that. All right, the heat in the west has become a big concern. Sacramento, Fresno, to Phoenix. Excessive heat warnings are posted through at least uh, Sunday, and we're looking at humidity levels in the southeast that are going to be dangerous with temperatures that will be measured in the mid to upper 90s in New Orleans, Atlanta, and Memphis. And that's through at least tomorrow, probably extending into Sunday as well. Around that heat ridge is where we're seeing storms tonight. St. Louis, you'll get hit. You'll probably get another round uh, during the day tomorrow. And that could have some damaging winds pushing up the Ohio River Valley and through Lexington, Charleston, and then stretching farther into uh, Sunday. We'll probably see this get into the mid-Atlantic, D.C., Philly, and parts of the Northeast Sunday night. Stephanie? Lots to watch. Thanks so much, Rob. Have a great holiday weekend. Tens of millions of Americans will be in the sky and on the roads to celebrate the 4th of July. Airlines say they've largely caught up after a brutal week of cancellations and delays, but can they handle a record rush? ABC's Trevor Alt is at Newark Airport. Tonight, the 4th of July travel rush already off and running for millions of Americans. After a nightmarish week at airports with thousands of delays and cancellations from weather and staffing shortages, TSA estimating nearly 18 million people will fly this holiday weekend, with today projected to be the busiest day. I got up extra early so that just so there's any issues with TSA. We got here early and we expected 
exactly what we're seeing. And even more Americans are hitting the road. Today is really busy. We, got, we had to get off 81 and go on some crazy kind of loop-de-loop uh, -loop to get through this stop-and-go traffic. So. Experts say drivers will want to take off tomorrow before noon, with the most congestion around 1 p.m. And drivers can take some solace with gas prices, now averaging $3.57 a gallon nationwide, down $1.30 from this time last year. Our thanks to Trevor. Turning now overseas to the crackdown in France after days of violent protests sparked by the fatal police shooting of a 17-year-old of North African descent during a traffic stop near Paris. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge is in Paris. Stephanie, violent demonstrations underway in major French cities for a fourth consecutive night. Riots are breaking out right across the country this week after the deadly police shooting of a 17-year-old French boy of North African descent on Tuesday. Prosecutors say the teen was shot after he failed to stop his car when told to do so by police. An officer now under investigation for voluntary homicide. French President Macron calling the riots unacceptable and unjustifiable, blaming social media for spreading copycat violence. Tonight, 45,000 police officers on the streets to try and quell the violence. Stephanie? Thanks so much, Tom, for that update. New York Representative George Santos made his first court appearance in Long Island today after pleading not guilty to 13 counts. Attorneys called the brief appearance a, quote, basic status conference as the federal case moves forward. The indictment accuses Santos of fraud, money laundering, and theft of public funds. The Republican congressman, who says he did nothing wrong, was handed an American flag as he left court by one supporter, while a protester there shouted at him and called for his resignation. Fox News has settled a pair of lawsuits brought by a former employee for $12 million. That's according to a statement issued by the employee's attorney. The case brought by former Fox News producer Abby Grossberg, who worked with Maria Bartiromo and Tucker Carlson. She accused the network of fostering a, quote, toxic atmosphere, victimizing women. The eight-figure settlement comes just two months after Fox News settled the defamation lawsuit brought by Dominion Voting Systems for a record-breaking $787.5 million. There is still much more to get to here on Prime. Body camera video shows tense moments as a Georgia police officer tries to pull a man from a burning car. But next, millions of Americans are losing their Medicaid coverage as pandemic protections end. Rachel Scott is with families caught up in the purge in our series, Through the Cracks. I'm a caretaker and I felt like a bad mom. Like, yes. oh my, like she'll get less care because she doesn't have insurance, and that's the Good truth. Job. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> How cute. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When the pandemic hit this country, Congress took action to prevent states from removing Americans from Medicaid coverage. But with the end of the pandemic health emergency, states have now begun that process of clearing their roles of people who aren't eligible to stay on that program. But as Rachel Scott reports, millions of Americans are mistakenly being removed despite still being eligible. She takes, takes a look at the families caught in the middle in our series, Through the Cracks. For five-year-old Penelope, Appointments like these have become all too familiar. At such a young age, she's had more visits to the hospital than birthdays, never going longer than a few weeks without sitting in an exam room. So my understanding is that she's here because she's having staring episodes and they've been seizures in the past, so we wanted to confirm is she still having seizures or not, is that correct? Right, and then she's scheduled for 48 hours. Her mother, Jillian, there by her side, longing for the day this won't be their reality. Oh, you're doing so good. Penelope was born with classic galactosemia, a rare genetic metabolic disorder that can cause lifelong health complications. I would spend every dollar if I had to to make sure she was okay, you know, because um, she's just, she's just such a fighter. You're being so good today. <laughs> for this family in South Florida, Medicaid is their lifeline, reducing the cost of Penelope's medications. This first medication she takes for seizures, um, this is about $1,000. But in the first week of May, Jillian and her husband Rocky say they found out their daughter had unexpectedly lost her health care coverage. Just as states began to roll back pandemic era protections, removing millions from their roles. When did you learn that Penelope lost coverage? My occupational therapist, uh, texted me and said she's no longer on our um, Medicaid list. She's been dropped. And it was just like, this has to be a mistake. What was going through your mind? I eventually had a complete breakdown. Like the day that you called, I was crying all day. It was just so overwhelming, it's so defeating. My whole life is taking care of her, I'm her caretaker. And I felt like a bad mom. Like, yes, oh my, good. like she'll get less care because she doesn't have insurance, and that's the Good truth. Job. I'm so grateful mm. for Medicaid because of um, we couldn't do we it. couldn't do it. Yeah. We couldn't do it. It would be impossible. Jillian is a registered nurse, but she says the insurance process has been difficult to navigate, spending hours on the phone trying to get answers. Do you know why Penelope was kicked off of her coverage? Ultimately, I don't. They didn't even tell me that I was dropped. I didn't, and I went through all of my letters to see where I was dropped, and there was absolutely not a single letter um, in my profile online. You've gotten no answer. No, no answers whatsoever. Across the country, federal officials estimate at least 1.5 million Americans have lost their Medicaid coverage since April. For the last three years, states were barred from kicking people off the program. That's all changed now that the pandemic era rules have been lifted and it's sparking confusion across the nation. In Tallahassee, Liz Adams says her seven-year-old son in remission for leukemia was dropped with no explanation. We went six months back into our emails and our spam and there was nothing. There was no notifications from them at all. Emotionally, it's been taxing to say the least. In Gravette, Arkansas, Allison Quarter says by the time she found a mailed notice from the state, her and her son were already uninsured. I've moved since then. I've gotten a million letters in the mail. And it's just really confusing what they're wanting from me. And in Clay County, Florida, Marnie Harvich says her 13-year-old daughter, Cassidy, who relies on a ventilator to breathe, was almost kicked off of Medicaid prematurely. It's insane. Not only are you fighting to keep them insured, you're fighting to keep them alive. These families, all part of the 15 million Americans who could lose coverage as states begin tightening the rules. The problem, with such a big undertaking, Medicaid officials estimate half of those Americans could be dropped by mistake. Seven million people who are eligible to receive Medicaid could still actually lose their coverage.
Why is that happening? So that is the one of the pieces I mentioned that is a paramount concern to us and why it's been a how do we move heaven and earth moment over the past two years. We should not accept that as uh, success or how we think about what we're trying to achieve is. We need to make sure we do everything, federal, state, the private sector, other partners, to keep everybody eligible um, enrolled. Daniel Sai is a director at CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal agency overseeing the process. He says procedural errors, misnotices, and confusion are all in part to blame for eligible recipients losing coverage. CMS says it has been pushing states to streamline the process. And a lot of the strategies and options we've been putting on the table are options for states to help be able to do more upfront automated renewals. Are some states resistant toward that change? There's more to do. And indeed, some states have taken us up on every option and strategy that we put on the table. For the states that are not following these guidelines, what action is being taken? If we find that um, even with the best intentions or not, if um, the federal rules are not being followed, folks should expect us to take um, and use every lever at our disposal. At least 25 states so far have started disenrolling people from Medicaid. Florida dropping 303,000. Arkansas, some 110,000. This is a really heavy lift. We see um, mistakes are made. Families don't get the letter, they don't understand the letter, they have a hard time getting help. In an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, Arkansas's Republican Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders says, we're simply removing ineligible participants from the program to reserve resources for those who need them and follow the law. But advocates and experts are concerned that potentially thousands, especially children, are slipping through the cracks. We know that the vast majority of children who may lose coverage during this process will remain eligible for Medicaid. Florida's Department of Children and Family says it has developed a robust outreach campaign, including up to 13 direct contact attempts to recipients who do not submit a timely application. While the state declined to comment on Penelope's case due to privacy concerns, a spokesperson maintained everyone that is removed from Medicaid receives a final notice informing them the reason for termination. But Jillian and Rocky say they are still looking to the state of Florida for answers. After several weeks of calls and working with an advocacy group, they were finally able to get their daughter Penelope back on Medicaid, at least until the end of the review process. Penelope now is covered through March of next year. Is that temporary relief? Do you fear that she could still lose her coverage in a year? You are waiting for the other shoe to drop. Um, I don't trust trust it, because um, if this can happen, it can happen again. Right, it's just very simple questions and, and still don't have answers. No one still knows why. I mean, someone denied it. They don't know why. No one's held accountable. An absolute nightmare for those parents and so many families. Our thanks to Rachel Scott for that eye-opening report. Still ahead, new allegations against the armorer charged in that deadly shooting on the Rust film set. How the documentary Everybody is trying to provide a deeper understanding of what it means to be intersex. But next, travel and celebration plans are in full swing. We take a look at who's heading out of town for the holiday and how much those cookouts will cost you by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. I was going to put every piece of energy I had into music. 
I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know, I still need help. Somebody say me. I love you. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. If you're headed out of town this holiday weekend, you are not alone. We're taking a look at who's hitting the road this 4th of July and what that barbecue will cost you by the numbers. Nearly 18 million people are expected to pass through the nation's airports this weekend. That's a July 4th record, according to the TSA. The good news for flyers is that domestic tickets have dropped more than $100 from last year, according to travel booking site Hopper. AAA says it is a record-breaking summer for car travel as well. More than 43 million people will hit the road this holiday. That is up 2.4% from last year and up 4% pre pandemic. There is good news for drivers as well. The average cost for a gallon of gas is down $1.30 from the same time last year. As for that 4th of July barbecue, the news is mixed. Steak prices are still sky high, up nearly 3% from a year ago, but ground beef prices have held steady at $5.36 a pound, and chicken breasts are 2% cheaper than they were last year. For the extras, we can't forget the extras, potato chips cost 15% more this year after drought in Idaho and the Dakotas hit last year's crop. Soda prices are up 14% and beer will cost you 8% more. Whether you're celebrating this 4th of July on a faraway beach or in your backyard, we definitely wish you a safe and happy one. And there is still much more ahead here on Prime. Our continuing coverage on the Supreme Court's decision to rule against student loan forgiveness. What it could mean for borrowers, finances, and for our economy. And it may be small, but it can become a huge annoyance. The swarm of insects causing a nuisance in New York City. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? 
the newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. Oh so what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. President Biden responded to the Supreme Court's 6-3 decision against student loan forgiveness in remarks late today, saying he was disappointed and discouraged, like many Americans. He also said this isn't the last attempt to provide relief. To help break down the impact of today's ruling, I am joined by ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus. So nice to see you. Great to be with you, Stephanie. Live in person. <laughs> uh, so the White House was looking to, to wipe out $400 billion in federal loans owed by 43 million Americans. The court ruled that that is not going to happen. So many Americans will have that stress of paying a student loan bill. So what does this mean for someone's finances at an individual level? At the individual level, you know, somebody who hasn't made a payment in three years, that's a long time. If you have to start repaying again, it can really be a shock to your financial system. And people's situations may have changed over the past three years. Their financial situations, maybe they had a child, they got married, they lost a job. Maybe they're better off than they were three years ago. And also remember, some people graduated during the pandemic, which means they haven't had to make a payment on those student loans yet. They're going to have to, though, later this year quite the shocker. Uh, what about for the broader economy? Well, you know, the money that would have been used to do other things will now have to go towards paying off these loans, right? So that's sort of the trickle-down effect. Uh, over the course of the life of that loan, it's thousands of dollars that someone would have saved to perhaps go out and buy a, a house, a car, start a family. Um, so that sort of boost to the economy won't be happening. Taxpayers, of course, won't be footing the bill here. And any revenue that the government would have seen from these loans will now happen. 
So for those that have had that break for the last couple of years, what is the grace period like? When do those payments start to kick in again? All right, that's the big question. And we have some clarity. Interest will start accruing September 1. You're going to have to start repaying sometime in October. The Department of Education says they'll give us ample time to know. It also depends on what kind of a loan you have. That may also dictate when you have to start repaying. But look to start doing that in October. As for that grace period, President Biden announced that there will be a 12-month on-ramp period, which means that if you can't make a payment, interest will still accrue, but that is not going to get set to, sent to collections. You won't be in default. Uh, it will not hurt your credit score. So it gives people a little more breathing room while they get used to the fact that they have to make these payments again. So we know this is going to be a hit for a lot of people's budgets. So what are some tips for borrowers? Well, what you want to start doing is pretending like you owe that money now. Start putting that money aside now, you can do so in a high-yield savings account, so you make a little money on your money. Also, contact your loan service provider. That entity may have changed over the past three years. That's pretty typical. You can log on to studentaid.gov to find out who they are. Make sure your personal info with them is up to date and explore payment plans because they are out there. The Supreme Court decision didn't squash that. There's something called income-driven repayment plans. President Biden has now made the, um, the parameters around those a little more generous, and so they peg what you owe on that loan to your income and your family size. So there is some relief out there. You're just going to have to do some homework to get it. There are some options. Do the homework. Thank you so much, Alexis, for those tips. My pleasure. The heart-stopping moments, an officer rushed to pull a man from a burning car. And the new accusations about the armorer on the Rust film set. And the tiny nuisance plaguing New York City. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. New video shows the heroic actions of a Georgia police officer who pulled a man from a burning vehicle. Oh, come on, give me a hand. South Fulton police released body camera video from June 17th showing officer Kevin Turner pulling the man from the car following an accident and getting him out before the fire engulfed the car. Police commended officer Turner's actions in a statement saying he embodied the essence of a hero. The rust armorer charged with manslaughter and the deadly shooting on the film set is now accused of handing off a bag of cocaine to someone else after her interview with police. Prosecutors made the claim about Hannah Gutierrez-Reed in a court filing and asked to protect the identity of the witness who made the claim in a motion Thursday. Gutierrez-Reed is charged with two counts of involuntary manslaughter in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins on set, as well as evidence tampering. Reed's attorney, Jason Bowles, said in a statement the new claims were, quote, full of sound and fury, but signify nothing. Prosecutors urged a federal appeals court to uphold the conviction of Gilan Maxwell. Maxwell had asked the court in February to overturn her conviction and prison sentence on charges she trafficked women and girls for Jeffrey Epstein to abuse. Prosecutors said in a brief reply that evidence at the trial showed that Maxwell had facilitated and participated in the sexual abuse. Maxwell was convicted in 2021 and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Oscar-winning actor Alan Arkin has died. Most recently, Arkin starred alongside Michael Douglas in the hit Netflix show The Kaminsky Method. The role scored him a couple of Emmy nominations, and Arkin won an Oscar for playing a foul-mouthed grandpa in the quirky comedy Little Miss Sunshine. He was nominated for three other Oscars, most recently in 2013, for his supporting role in Ben Affleck's Argo. Alan Arkin was 89. <laughs> Transgender influencer Dylan Mulvaney addressed the months-long backlash stemming from her brief partnership with Bud Light. Mulvaney shared on Instagram that she had been scared to leave her home and has been ridiculed and followed after her April video with the brand. She also accused the company of not reaching out and supporting her. For a company to hire a trans person and then not publicly stand by them is worse, in my opinion, than not hiring a trans person at all. Anheuser-Busch said in the statement that they were committed to their partnerships with organizations in a number of communities, including the LGBTQ community, and that the safety of their employees and partners was a top priority. New Yorkers facing a small but pesky challenge this week. Many have reported swarms of gnat-like insects across the city in the past few days. Videos posted to social media show numerous small insects around Manhattan and Brooklyn, with some pedestrians trying to fight them off, and others finding themselves covered in them. The bugs have not been officially identified, though outlets like the New York Times reported some experts believe they were aphids and that the mild winter might explain the swarms of them. In any case, the city's health department says that while the situation may be annoying, the bugs were not a known public health risk. 
At birth, babies are assigned a sex, but that assignment could cause complications, especially if someone is born intersex. Academy Award-nominated director Julie Cohen follows three people who were born intersex, including River Gallo, who are now hoping to help others develop a deeper understanding of what being intersex means in the new film, Every Body. Let's take a look. Society generally considers that biological sex is cut and dry. Actually, it's not cut and dry. We don't fall neatly into that male-female box. I was born intersex, and although I was born with a vagina, I was also born with internal testes. We live in a society that's so binary. So as an intersex person, where do I fit? Julie and River are joining me now. Thank you both so much for being here and breaking this down for us and introducing us to this film. Julie, I want to start with you. What does it mean to be intersex? Let's start there. Yes, good. Start with basics because our uh, level of uh, knowledge on this as a society is kind of woefully low. And obviously, you can't advocate for your rights if no one knows who you are. Um, intersex is an umbrella term for somewhere between 30 and 40 different biological variations. That means that someone's anatomy, chromosomes, hormones, or other sex traits don't fit neatly and squarely into the male and female boxes that we're accustomed to, to thinking are such a sharp divide. How common is this? for someone uh, to be born intersex. Right, well, um, it's much more common than people think. The figure that the United Nations uses is 1.7% uh, of the population with some kind of uh, intersex traits. Uh, a sort of by a narrower definition that might lead to surgical intervention is more like one out of every 1,500 people. You all have become leaders in this movement advocating for the intersex community. How has that been for you? I kind of happened upon the whole intersex rights movement and the community um, through the internet and social media. And it's just crazy to me that something that I thought I was going to take to the grave with me um, and never speak about these intimate parts of my body my whole life is now something that I'm creating art from and um, find a whole community of people who are also fighting for the rights of body autonomy. All right, let's watch a portion of the movie. Our goal is to pass a bill to condemn these medically unnecessary surgeries. A huge revolution starting right now. Hey, surgery! Just existing as an intersex person is grounds for celebration. So, kind of take us through your journey a little bit. So when I was 12, I was told that I was born without testes, um, so with a penis, but without testes, and that I would have to start taking testosterone to go through puberty. And then at 16, I had a surgery to implant prosthetic testicles into my scrotum. The idea being, if my genitals looked um, like that of a normal cisgendered man, that then I would have a normal life. Um, the irony of it all is that later in my life, I would then come out as trans feminine and non-binary. And the surgery that doctors said was necessary to for my health um, was actually just a cosmetic surgery um, and was not necessary to, for my gender now as a trans feminine, non-binary person. Um, so it was really hard for my parents who I grew up in El Salvador and came to the country in the 80s, and they were just kind of listening to doctor's orders. And it wasn't until I came in as queer in my early 20s and then intersex later on that I realized that all these notions of what my gender was was all decided for me. And it's not until now in my life that I'm actually taking agency over what my gender means to me now and how I wish to express it. What's the main message that you want people to walk away with once they, they watch this film? I want people to walk away from this film understanding that intersex people are exist, A, because <laughs> that's like the first step, um, that they're worthy of fair, humane medical treatment just like everyone else, um, and kind of wanting to advocate for their intersex friends and neighbors. I also really want people to walk away from this movie feeling good. There's a lot that's empowering and inspiring about the modern day intersex rights movement. 
River and Julie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, giving us your insights and, and introducing us to, for, or introducing those who may not be aware of intersex to that community. Thank you so much. You can watch Everybody right now in theaters. We're looking at a situation many families go through, including same-sex parents, how their children interact with the donors who are their biological fathers. Our Becky Worley has this story. When lesbians like Les Milstein and Noelle Plummer decide to start a family, there's a big hurdle. We're like, okay, how do we do this? We went to the donor bank. These clinics help same-sex couples, single women, or those with fertility issues find a sperm donor. We were looking at donor profiles and we wanted to find someone who we thought would be open and friendly. The Ethics Committee of the American Society of Reproductive Medicine strongly advocates for identity release. So when the child turns 18, they can contact their donor if interested. I think biological father is a good term to use. Someone like Sydney, Les and Noelle's daughter, who reached out to Ricardo Botello, her biological father. I wanted to learn about his family and his history and connect with my ethnicities. His belief in family is what Ricardo says led him to become a donor. My values is family. I wanted to help those who also wanted to experience what that is all about. After Sydney turned 18, she and Ricardo slowly got to know each other. I noticed that we have the same smile, and I think we have similar tendencies. But not all donor-conceived children choose to connect with their donors, like Janie Robert Adams. I personally don't plan on pursuing identity release. I have two parents who love me and so it doesn't really matter who the sperm donor was as much. Janie's brother Charlie is open to learning their donor's identity. I will probably pursue it just because I, I am at least somewhat interested as like what they did as a person in their life. Alice Ruby, executive director of the Sperm Bank of California, says some kids want to know, others don't. And for those who do contact their donors, the nature of those relationships is varied. Some of them have a couple emails and that's it. Some of them may talk on the phone. Some of them may meet in person. Some of them develop ongoing relationships. Our thanks to Becky. That is our show for tonight, folks. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thank you so much for joining us. You can always find ABC News Live on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, abcnews.com. Have a wonderful weekend. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes.
scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. You're a little bit scared. A little bit. The CEO of the company behind the groundbreaking ChatGPT, capable of doing everything from writing essays to analyzing pictures and even helping with your taxes, answering big questions. Could it become more powerful than that human? Plus, what do our most trusted tech experts think about artificial intelligence? How can AI change our world as lawmakers call for regulation? You look scared, Rich. Well, I mean, I, I, I am. Then, from kidnapping scams, where criminals use the rapidly evolving tech to fake your voice and fool your loved ones, to the entertainment industry, AI a sticking point in the Hollywood writer's strike. How artificial intelligence is working artists into songs they never recorded even bringing us a new Beatles song. And the tech effect on medicine, how the groundbreaking technology is being used with mammograms. And when it comes to spinal cord injuries, artificial intelligence and electronic implants using the power of one man's thoughts to help him walk for the first time in more than a decade. <laughs> 